If I could have only one telescope, which one would it be? Hmm. So, some ground rules here. I'm going to choose three finalists and rank them from number three to number one. Also, if I pick an optical tube assembly, I also get to choose the mount that goes underneath it. And whatever telescope I choose has to be available to the general public in some version. In other words, there are some beautiful custom-made Newtonians from club members who have built these things, and I could live with one of those easily, but, you know, you can't get one. On the other hand, my circa 1980s Takahashi FC76 would count because they have a new version out. The idea is anybody watching this video can go out afterwards and just order one of these things. So before we get to the three finalists, let's talk about some runners-up that I came up with that didn't quite make the cut and why. So my first runner-up is my astrophysics stowaway. Of course, you could make the argument that any astrophysics telescope is an automatic runner-up or finalist in any sort of list like this. So this thing, it doesn't gather much light, it's only 90 millimeters, but what's there is perfection. It's also great as an imaging telescope, and I have this thing set up for imaging right now. This is the field flattener on the end. That is a beautiful hunk of glass. So why didn't it make the final list? Well, although it is technically available to the general public, there is an enormous waiting list, as many of you know, to get any astrophysics telescope. I sat on a waiting list for 19 years before getting this one. So technically, yes, it's available, but I'm saying that it's not, so it doesn't make the list. Second runner-up, my Questar. Of course, like the astrophysics, you could make the argument that any Questar is an automatic shoe-in for a list of this kind. Questar, of course, elicits strong reactions from all sides. Some people, upon seeing this thing for the first time, declare that this is the telescope that they've been looking for all their lives and that they're never going to use anything else again, and they don't. Other people take a look at this and they kind of shrug their shoulders and walk away. I'm kind of strange here. I have a foot in both camps here. I appreciate the beautiful jewel-like construction here. It's just a tactfully wonderful to touch these knobs and to turn them. But on the other hand, and I admit this is probably my failing, I just don't use this thing very much, so call it voting with my feet. I'm saying this is not one of the three finalists because I just don't use it very much. The third runner-up, the Takahashi CN212. Okay, now we're talking. I have a review of this elsewhere on this channel, and I have to say, while I had that telescope here, it was some of the most fun I think I've had with any telescope in a long time probably the best lunar telescope I've ever seen in my life. And what's more, it's a convertible. You can change it from a Newtonian to a Cassegrain simply by swapping out the secondary mirror. So I'm kind of gaming my own system here. I'm getting two telescopes instead of one. Not only that, the 7x50 finder is so good on there, it's a wide field telescope of its own, it's almost like getting three telescopes in one. But, alas, they haven't made these things in over 10 years. It's not a currently produced model, so it doesn't make the final list. And the final runner-up is the Celestron C6 schmidt cassegrain May come as a surprise to you unless you happen to own one of these things. It's sort of the Toyota Corolla of the telescope world. Cheap, reliable, and they'll get the job done. You can do a little bit of everything with this telescope. You can do deep sky, lunar, planetary, Planetary imaging is excellent with this, and if you're good at it, deep sky imaging as well. You can put it on an alt as mount, you can put it on an equatorial go-to mount, whatever your choice. I'll tell you, this telescope came very close to making the final three, except one managed to edge it out. Okay, so those are the runner-ups. Now, let's meet the finalists. And here we are with the three finalists. They are in alphabetical order. The Celestron C9 and a quarter Schmidt Cassegrain, the Orion XT8 Dobsonian Reflector, and the Takahashi FS102 Fluorite Refractor. See if you can guess which one came out on top. And at number three, we have the Takahashi FS102 Fluorite Refractor. Those of you who follow me know just how highly I think of these. I think the 4-inch series of Takahashi fluorites are going to go down in history as one of the great product lines in our hobby. It doesn't seem to matter which one you get, they are all superb. FC100, 
FS-102, TSA-102, and what the heck, let's just go ahead and throw the FSQ-106 in there also. They are all superb. The new version is the FC-100. They have a number of different versions of that based upon what you want it to do. Just keep in mind, the $2,200 or so that you spend on the optical tube in any Takahashi ownership experience, this is just the beginning of you spending lots of money. You know what I really want is one of Takahashi's mounts. I'm looking at that EM200. There are a couple, a couple of club members who have one of those. Boy, those are beautiful, and I would love to get one of those one day, but boy, look at the price. These telescopes are equally at home, both with visual and for imaging use. I use this one mainly visually. Some of the best views of Jupiter I've ever had were through one of my two Takahashi FS-102s. But you know what's interesting? If you were to ask me which is your best imaging telescope, I think my immediate reaction would be it is either my Astrophysics Stowaway or one of my two Takahashi FS-60s. But it's interesting, whenever I have to pick an image either to show or to print out, it's surprising to me how often I pick one of the FS-102's images, despite the fact that I don't really use it that much for imaging. For example, this image of the Horsehead Nebula behind me, I wanted to print one of those out. This is the one I picked. So it is said, every great refractor ownership experience comes with a story. I had a friend contact me in Florida about this telescope. I had just sold an FS-102 and missed it, and he knew that. And he said, I've got a great deal on an FS-102 for you. And he quoted me a price that was much too low. And he said, it's fine. The only problem is it's blue. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And I decided I could live with the fact that it was blue for about a month. Then it started to bother me. I wanted to make this thing original, so I had to take the thing apart. I went to an auto body shop, and by the way, if any of you do this, they matched the paint to one of my other Takahashis. It's a color that GM used to use called Corvette White. It's got just a little bit of yellow in it. The problem is I had to take everything apart, and the lens cell had been painted over, and we couldn't get it apart. It took three of us with a strap wrench holding the thing down. It came loose with a crack. Some of us were convinced that we had cracked the lens. Fluoride is not exactly the most durable material in the world, but we checked and it was fine. The crack was the sound of the lens cell breaking loose. So those of you who know how much I love this telescope may be surprised that it's only number three on this list. If that's the case, you're gonna be even more surprised which one is number two. And at number two, we have the Celestron C9 and a quarter Schmidt Cassegrain. This is my favorite Schmidt Cassegrain of all time. I've never seen a bad one of these. Really, the only debate among aficionados of this model is which version do you get? There have been minor variations through the years. I don't see much difference between them. The tube color changes, the focuser changes a little bit. There's an edge version if you're into astrophotography. Equally at home with imaging and with visual use, you can do planetary, lunar, double star. And unlike the FS-102, it has enough aperture to pull in deep, uh, deep sky galaxies. Probably my only complaint about that FS-102, it doesn't quite have enough aperture. The only real concern about this particular telescope is its size, weight, and focal length puts it in between mount classes. You can put this on Celestron's CG5 AVX series of mid-size mounts. I know they do sell them that way, I don't know long-term if you're going to be happy with it. The combination of the weight and the 2350 millimeter focal length means it's going to magnify the jiggles and the shakes in your mount. And long-term, I think you're probably going to want something a little bit heavier. If you do go with a heavier mount, I would at least go with, in the Celestron line at least, the C-Gem. There have been two versions of that. If you speak Orion, it's an Atlas mount. It is also a Skywatcher HEQ-6. That class of mount is probably the minimum I would put on one of these things. And if you have something heavier, this is a G11 class mount. It's a Celestron CGE. The new CGX mounts, if you really want to go overboard, I like those very much as well. For imaging, I'm not very good at deep sky imaging through Schmidt Cassegrains. I know some of you are. Never been something I've been particularly good at, but for webcam, planetary, and lunar imaging, these things are just fantastic. 
the combination of the aperture and the focal length just seems to sit in a sweet spot for getting great images of Jupiter and Saturn. In fact, if you look at the master imagers of this craft, take a look at their equipment and very often you will see them using stock off the shelf C9 and a quarters, C11s, or C14s. So I'm sitting here and trying to decide if this is an upset or not. And you know, after I thought about it, I decided it's not because those of you who have seen me out in the field, you will see me with this telescope more than any of the others. I also tried phrasing the question in the negative. Which telescope, if it were to vanish, would cause me the most disruption in my life? And it would probably be this one because I use it so much. So this is a simple X-T8 Orion Dobsonian and a simple base that goes up and down and left and right. And I've talked about these things a lot in other videos. It doesn't seem to matter which one you get. You can get the Intelescope, the Push 2 electronic version. There's even a rare G version that has a go-to motor attached to it. There are other nameplates that sell similar products. They are all recommended. It doesn't seem to matter as long as you get one. Dobsonian owners very often are purists to the point where if you get one of these and it has one of these red dot reflex finder sights on it, some of you will actually replace that with a traditional optical finder if for no other reason that it means that there are no longer any electronics on your telescope at all. So when the zombie apocalypse hits, you can still go observing. So this thing and I have been on a lot of adventures together. I remember sometime in the mid 2010s, I was on a trip to Northern Maine. I was in corporate sales for a long time and I had reached the point where burnout was starting to settle in and I didn't want to take the trip. I was just sitting on the couch, staring into space, trying to figure out how to get out of this trip. The last minute I took this telescope with me, just threw it in the back. And a couple of days later, I was on the trip and I was taking a client out to lunch and he looked in the back of the car and he said, what in the world is that? And I told him and he said, you know what, I've always had an interest in that. Would you mind coming over tonight? My wife's a good cook. I have a farm and maybe we can have some fun. And I'll tell you, those were the nicest people I ever met, uh, met their kids. And when he said he had a farm, he wasn't kidding. It was out in the middle of nowhere. There were no lights anywhere. And we spent a couple of hours and I showed them the sights in the night sky. A couple of years later, that paper mill closed down and much of the county became unemployed as a result. I lost track of that guy. I always wondered what happened to him. So you see, it's not about the equipment. It's more about the experiences that we have with it and the people that we meet. So there you have it. Are you surprised by the result? I'm telling you, I think I'm okay with this. Those of you who know me know that I go long stretches of time using only that X-T8. I think the only thing I would miss would be the imaging part of it, but I'm probably doing a little too much of that lately. I need to get back to my observing roots. Anyway, did you notice their scopes finished in reverse order of their price, the cheap scope one. I've said this before, but astronomy is like a lot of other hobbies. You wind up spending a lot of money just to learn that you didn't have to spend a lot of money in the first place. You just have to be told where to spend the money, and hopefully this channel has been of some help to some of you. Anyway, how are you doing? Do you have a one scope collection, either by necessity or by choice? If so, leave a comment below. I'm sure we'd love to hear from you. Until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.